Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Zhao Yili, a GSD candidate at Uni Washington University in St. Louis School of Law. Uh, thank you all for coming to this session. First of all, I want to thank American Society of Comparative Law for giving us this opportunity to present our papers. Uh, the topic of our panel is to compare the corporate law and security laws of uh, China and the US and uh, offer implications for both the Chinese and US courts and policymakers. China's new security law has been issued in 2020, and China will revise the corporate law this year as well. Certain amendments to these two laws draw upon the US corporate law and security law, transplanting several principles. Uh, before the presentation begins, allow me to introduce our panelists. Professor Zeng is an assistant professor at, of law at the university, uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong. His research interests include corporate law and finance, economic regulations, and law and economics. Dr. Zhang is a lecturer at Zhejiang University of Finance and Economics, China. She earned a SGD degree from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Uh, the discussion will be divided into two parts. First part is the presentation. The second part is 30 minutes Q&A. Please use the Q&A function to force your questions to the panelists. Um, so I will be the uh, first speaker. Uh, I will share my screen. Oh, can you all uh, see my screen? Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Zhao Yi. My topic is judicial review of the director duty of care, a comparison between uh, US and China. Uh, first of all, I want to um, introduce the background here. In response to the Asian financial crisis, China revised its legal code to strengthen its corporate law regime. Uh, after amendment in 2005, Articles 147 and 148 of the uh, company law state that the director have a duty of care to the company. The amendments fail to explain the rule of judicial review in enforcing the director duty of care. With the increasingly active and diversified business activities of Chinese companies, weakness in company law are constantly emerging and evolving. The lack of standard for director's duty of care make it difficult for Chinese court to rule. Some courts show too much strength, some courts um, are too active. It is essential that uh, China's company law to establish a unified standard of review with regard to the duty of care. The duty of care is a well chosen territory in the US and the, the director liability is a predicted on specific standards. U.S. judges, lawmakers, and scholars have spent decades debating whether to adopt the ordinary negligence standard or gross negligence standard. The current standard is that directors should discharge their duties with the care that a person in a like position would reasonably believe appropriate under similar circumstances. However, the BGR transformed the duty of care standard review from the ordinary negligence standard to gross negligence standard under Arizona. Both the BGR and the DGCL 1027 shall director from responsibility for their actions, which may weaken the impact of the duty of care. In order to solve the problem of lacking Chinese director duty of care standard in legislation, this paper examines Delaware standards duty of care and put forward some effective suggestions to improve China's duty of care standard through comparative law. First of all, I want to talk about uh, duty of care's enforcement in China. In the five years since the duty of care was written into the company law of China, few cases regarding the duty of care have been brought. In recent years, with the development of Chinese market and the China China corporate governance, around 800 lawsuits concerning duty of care have been filed. Due to the lack of uniform provision on the duty of care standards, the standards of various courts are different. Some courts notice that directors should exercise their duty of care on ordinary prudent person. 
and some calls uh, require director to have the ability and the prudence corresponding to their position. Some courts have used a gross negligence standard and uh, directly exempt the directors according to the BJR. The next question will be why the standard need to be stipulated? First of all, the appeal rate of the duty of care cases is extremely high. And uh, also the reason why China didn't introduce a clear standard is because there are not enough cases of the duty of care at that time. Some Chinese courts have realized the shortcoming of the existing legal norms. So some courts already began to reform the um, mature series and judicial practice, uh, such as US or UK or other common law countries were attempting to define the standard of duty of care. The next part will be the overview and rethinking on the standards of duty of care in the US. Instead of straightforwardly based on whether the duty exists and was violated, the Delaware's court judgment on the breach of duty of care grounded on the standard of review. The standard of conduct defines how corporate governance actors should behave. If directors are judged according to the standards they should abide, then the standard of review should be negligent. However, the standard of conduct are considered unenforceable in law practice and academia. The ideal situation is that a higher standard of conduct encourage directors to fulfill their duties, and a lower standard of review encourage directors to make bold decisions. However, the standard of conduct is dominated by the differential standard of review and combined with the weak litigation enforcement mechanism. This reduces the significance of the existence of the standard of conduct. It is inevitable that some directors conduct themselves according to the standard of review. As a result, the director may not actively perform according to their duty of care. Separating standard of conduct from standard of review allow court to set a certain requirement for director conduct and set a less demanding and more forgiving standard to decide whether director should take responsibility. As one commentator stated that the genius of Delaware lawmaker put their ability to generate a sick fiduciary law without at the same time imposing a significant compliance burden. Then I want to talk about the gross negligence standard. In the US corporate law uh, contact, the gross negligence standard refers to the conduct that goes beyond the ordinary negligence by showing a devil may care attitude. More specifically, gross negligence shows reckless indifference to or a deliberate disregard of a whole body of stockholders or actions, which are without the bounds of reasons. It is obvious that the gross negligence standard is a less enacting standard that requires proof of reckless indifference or gross abuse of discretion. The rationale for setting such a deliberately learned standard is same as BGR. The next question will be, uh, if the duty of care already becomes a dead letter and how to revitalize the duty of care. Uh, my first suggestion would be encouraging judges to write more judicial commentary based on the quality of the director decision making process. In this way, it can uh, effectively make up for the lack of uh, legal liability in corporate laws duty of care from both aspects of scrutiny of uh, oversight. Uh, comments can clarify the scope of director accept, accept, acceptable behavior and can warn other directors potential misconduct that would cross the legal boundaries. Uh, various courts in different states have long uh, impressed that uh, judges are not uh, business experts. However, judges can make a decision 
um, on medical cases without understanding medicine. The other judges have extensive experience in corporate law matters, as they have uh, conducted uh, an in-depth and uh, systematic analysis of a large number of corporate law cases. The other judges' knowledge is not limited to abstract legal dogma, uh, as they are good at uh, analyzing complex transactions, reading directors' testimonies, and reviewing the board meetings minutes, even if cause like uh, sufficient uh, discrimination in reviewing the substan substantive marine of the business decision, the court's ability to review the decision making process is insufficient. Therefore, the judicial incompetence in the duty of care like uh, uh, strong persuasion. And the next suggestion is uh, downplay the difference between the uh, standard of conduct and standard of review. As for the liability for uh, director for gross negligence, court, court can make a director who violates the duty of care because of excessive prudence and or inaction pays more a portion of the expenses for the act, acts of gross negligence. Mm, the next question will be who should be as a burden of proof. The other corporate law presumes that a director made business decision uh, acted on an informed basis in good faith and in the honest belief that the action taken was in the best interest of the company. In order to rebut the presumption, the plaintiff must first plead and later prove to prevail. The burden is on the plaintiff to show that the director breached their duty of care. Uh, if the plaintiff established the facts such as uh, about the gross negligence to rebut the presumption, then the burden shifts to the defendant. However, a uh, lighting plaintiff carries the burden of proving might increase the loss rates of the case as the plaintiff does not participate in the daily operation of the company. A defendant is more likely to have easy access to the company's information and has a better understanding of the management and decision making process. Therefore, reversing the burden of proof in the duty of care cases should be taken into consideration. Uh, the third part is the implications to China. First of all, I want to talk about the legal transplant. Uh, learning from the principle of the standard of duty of care in a common law country system and combining this principle with the needs of China's practice can effectively uh, improve the standard of Chinese director duty of care. Um, because the legal transplantation is cheap, fast, and efficient, and many countries, including China, adopted the method of legal transplantation to change the law. Um, even the transplantation is between different legal systems, civil law and common law. However, hasty uh, transplantation may not be suitable for the actual situation and may make the transplanted judicial provisions appear to perform poorly as they are not commonly used not well understood or cannot be well explained by the judges or become the cause of abuse litigation. In common law countries, uh, fiduciary duty is mainly defined by judges through case law. Well, in China, it is mainly defined by legislators through statute law. The Anglo-American fiduciary duties rely on the involving case law after transplantation the codified civil law system can only cover part of the meaning of fiduciary duty understood by its arranging jurisdictions. The judges in the transplant country may only understand and use the literal meaning of the original concept, but ignore the flexible application with its deep evolution. Therefore, the formulation of duty care standard cannot transplant exactly the US practice. Then there is a proposal to the amendment of uh, Chinese corporate law. Mm, the first one is which standard to choose. Chinese corporation corporate, 
corporate uh, governance is still in its infancy, and money in Chinese listed companies' equity is concentrated in controlling shareholders. Directors are elected by the majority shareholders. Most of the directors make decisions according to the wishes of the controlling shareholders. Therefore, when directors face the risk of being investigated for responsibility, controlling shareholders are likely to protect the director from being sued, and it is difficult for directors to be held accountable. In addition, directors might also serve as executives and shareholders, especially in closed corporations and family-owned enterprises, which have not reached the level of professional management. It is likely that uh, lazy directors would only comply with the minimum standard if the law directly uh, stipulated the uh, low standard. Therefore, these standards are not suitable for the current situation of corporate governance in China. Uh, this paper argues that uh, Chinese company law should establish a standard that combines the subjective negligence standard and the more objective gross negligence standard. This means that ordinary directors should only bear the responsibility in the case of gross negligence. The skilled directors should be held liable for both ordinary and gross negligence. This proposal put forward higher requirements for directors who are highly professional and uh, irreplaceable, such as director of large public traded company. For directors who are less professional and replaceable, the application co conditions of their uh, care duties can be uh, reduced. The last part is about uh, um, monetary liability. Do Chinese law need to provide a 102B7 safe harbor? Uh, first of all, uh, monetary compensation can be reduced for the decision making mistakes, but the compensation liability for gross negligence in the course of performance of duties should not be reduced. Um, the compensation limit can be stipulated. For example, the amount of compensation payable by the director shall not exceed 3% of the actual loss of the company or twice the annual income of the directors. In addition, uh, the indemnization and the insurance to the negligent director should be limited. Uh, also, I proposed uh, uh, reversing the burden of proof. Uh, burden of proof. Uh, the last thing is about uh, judicial commentary. The function of uh, uh, judicial commentary have not been effective effectively utilized in the Chinese version of uh, duty of care. Um, Chinese court's commentary had too little reasoning on judicial review. Um, the judge, judgment should uh, clearly explain what the director should do, what are the best practice, what is the limitation of director behavior, so as to provide clear guidance for the director to regulate their own behaviors. So in conclusion, in order to achieve good corporate uh, governance, one needs to balance the relationship between law supervision of directors and uh, uh, incentivizing good behavior. If the standard of duty of care is too rigorous, it will limit the effect of incentive. If the standard is too low, there will be vacuum of uh, supervision. The experience of the U.S. provide uh, valuable governance experience for the establishment of the uh, China's digital care standard. And uh, China's company law should transplant the digital care standard according to the national condition. Uh, specifically, Article 147 of the Chinese company law should stipulate that the standard of duty of care is a combination of ordinary neg negligence standard and the gross negligence standards. Thank you for listening. Uh, our next speaker is uh, 
uh, Professor Zeng, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Zhang Yi. Uh, right, let me share my screen with you. Can you uh, see it? Yeah, thank you very much. So um, I would like to share with you today um, some of my thoughts on the regulation of defensive tactics in China, as uh, Zhao Yi has mentioned in her, in her presentation. China is right now um, considering reforming its uh, corporate law and has already amended its securities law. So um, this has become a very important topic in recent years, uh, given a series of uh, hostile takeovers in the Chinese capital market. So um, I want to look into some of the uh, legal issues that China have encountered and um, how um, Chinese law could adjust that. Okay. And um, this uh, project is funded by the early career scheme of uh, the RGC of Hong Kong. Okay. So this is an outline um, of what I would like to adjust today. First of all, I will briefly review the debates on defensive tactics and um, um, some of the theories that have been proposed. I'll be very brief because I'm sure everyone here is already very familiar um, with those theories. And then I'll talk about the practice and law of defensive tactics in China. Okay. Um, in that part, I'll focus on the, some of the empirical findings, um, the, the current practice, okay, what are the types of uh, defensive tactics that have been used by the corporations. And then um, in the third part, I will introduce an empirical analysis of um, uh, legal regulation of uh, defensive tactics, and then um, try to draw some uh, implications. Okay. And part four will conclude. So first of all, a very brief uh, review of the theories and debates on defensive tactics. Um, there are different views as to whether the company should uh, use defensive tactics against hostile takeovers and there are view, different views about how law should handle it. Basically, uh, scholars on one side would say that uh, defensive tactics prevent shareholders from receiving these premiums from the hostile takeover, okay? Um, because they reduce the likelihood of hostile takeover. The company set up these defenses, uh, potential hostile acquirers would not uh, choose to take over the company to buy up these shares. And as a result, shareholders cannot get these premiums from the takeover. Okay. And um, they, these scholars also point to the problem of agency costs. Okay. Um, setting up these defensive tactics would um, enable the managers to entrench themselves. And uh, as a result, there might be higher agency costs because they're less susceptible to the market force, uh, the market of corporate control. Um, advocates of um, defensive tactics would um, argue that um, they benefit the shareholders because they actually raise the premiums the shareholder may get during this hostile takeover rather than um, buying them from receiving the premiums. So um, an example we can talk about is the, the Van Kuhn and Bono, um, takeover battle, okay, in which um, um, the hostile takeover kind of um, um, buy up the shares and uh, the price of the target company uh, increased. So the shareholders of the target receive a lot of the premiums um, from the hostile takeover. Okay, that is before uh, the company has set up any meaningful defensive tactics. And advocates also point to uh, the stability of uh, the operation of the company. Okay. More defensive tactics can ensure that uh, 
the management is not easily replaced, so they can focus on the long-term strategy of the company. Okay. So let's take a look at China um, and see some of the practice and law there. Um, so traditionally, uh, we all know that uh, concentrated ownership structure is the dominant structure in China. Okay, most companies have controlling shareholders um, holding like uh, more than 30 or 40 percent and the rest are just retail investors who do not have any influence over the management of the company. Okay. In um, 2016, um, more than 500 listed corporations have a largest shareholder holding less than 20% of the stock. So you see some kind of uh, dispersed shareholding in China in recent years. Okay. That kind of triggered the hostile takeovers. Okay. So um, you have the famous case, Yao Zhenhua versus Wan Ke, which I talked about um, earlier. Basically, you, Yao Zhenghua is the hostile acquirers, and um, the, the battle against Wan Ke kind of failed, but uh, he succeeded in taking control of other listed companies. Here are some common types of defensive tactics. Okay? First of all, restrictions on the replacement of the board of directors. This is kind of similar to stack, staggered board uh, idea in the United States but uh, not quite because um, it, um, it is designed a little bit differently. Um, let, let's take, take a look at an example here uh, in Hubei Fuxing Science and Technology Company Limited. The company says that less than one third of the current member of the board can be replaced when the term expired and less than one fourth can be replaced every year afterwards. So you have some kind of uh, staggered board, but usually these provisions are triggered when there is a hostile acquirers. If there's no hostile acquisition, then um, we don't have staggered board in these companies. Okay, so there are some slight differences. Second type of uh, defensive tactics could um, be used to deprive the voting rights sometimes uh, of certain shareholders. Um, an example would be uh, the corporate charter of uh, Longping High Tech Company, um, in which it says that uh, if a hostile takeover um, occur and uh, the hostile acquirer has not received approval from the company, then the shareholder um, cannot vote. Okay, so that is a very uh, draconian restriction on the rights of the hostile acquirer. The third type of defensive tactics is the, the so-called the golden parachute that gives um, compensation to the directors. Okay. And then the last um, type is the, the holding peer requirement, which is more prevalent. Okay. In my um, empirical findings, over 200 corporations have adopted this requirement. Okay. This is kind of similar to the time-phased voting arrangements that um, you sometimes see in the United States. Um, there might be slight differences because um, in other jurisdictions, usually the, the company gives more vote to the long-term shareholders. But um, in, in China, it's um, kind of a restriction on the rights of uh, hostile acquirers. Okay. So here are some more examples in um, Bao An Group. The, co the corporate articles um, of the association or the corporate charter provides that um, less than half of the current members can be replaced when their term expired and less than one fourth can be replaced every year afterwards. Okay. It's also a restriction on the replacement of the board of directors. In uh, Shandong Jingtai, uh, you see a 270 day holding period requirement. That is a shareholder needs to hold a share for 20, 270 days before they can appoint the director. Okay, that is the, the holding period requirement. 
imposed on these uh, companies. So um, shareholders who hold the shares for longer term, longer than 270 days, will be able to um, um, have the voting rights. Let's talk a little bit about the law in China uh, that govern defensive tactics. There are three major legal constraints. First of all, the company needs to issue a special resolution by a general meeting. Um, so it's harder than, than ordinary resolutions. Okay, the, the company needs more vote. And then um, the company law provides these fiduciary duty uh, requirements, which uh, Zhao Yi has mentioned, so I won't go into the details. Uh, basically, you have one, Article 147 that governs the conduct of the directors. Um, so uh, to propose uh, these defensive tactics, the company needs to amend its corporate charter, and therefore it, it will need these uh, director resolutions and special resolution by the shareholders. Um, there's a third legal constraint, which is basically the mandatory rule. Um, Article 102 of the Chinese company law provides these, uh, if the shareholder is holding 3% of the share, um, they can submit a uh, proposal to be discussed at the general meeting. So some um, court or some scholars or regulators take this to mean that, that the company cannot change um, the rights of the shareholders to submit a proposal, they lie. A proposal to replace the board is also a proposal. So if you treat that as a mandatory rule in the company law, that means you cannot um, restrict the rights of the shareholders to remove um, the board of directors. And then there are some different regulatory bodies in China, um, the CSRC, uh, the CSISC, um, the CRRC is in charge of security regulation, so it's more focused on information disclosure. But um, the CSISC is a newly established organ that can initiate lawsuits against listed companies. Um, when the CSISC initiate lawsuits, the court will hear the case, and therefore the court becomes uh, a regulator of listed companies. Um, stock exchanges also play a role. I have an article published uh, on this. So the stock exchange issue these letters of concern to listed companies, which kind of uh, impose some regulation on the listed companies. Okay. So some of the draconian uh, provisions like this one, okay, Dong Ping Gao Ke, and the others that um, deprive the hostile acquirers of their voting rights were uh, in place like before. But since 2016, uh, when the stock exchange started to issue these letters of consent, um, they kind of uh, gradually disappeared. Okay, I have a paper that looked into this process. So it's quite successful in regulating draconian takeover defenses. But um, um, after the regulation of stock exchanges, um, we still see a lot of companies that have uh, these holding period requirement in their corporate charter. All right, so um, I wanna spend the rest of the time briefly uh, talk about uh, an empirical study that I just conducted with regard to um, the last type of takeover defense, okay, on the holding period requirements. Basically, I use um, an identification strategy of um, looking into some of the events um, in China. So that uh, I focus on the actions taken by the CSISC and the court. So on uh, April 18, 2017, the CSISC um, initiated a regulatory action against um, company that has adopted the holding period requirement. Um, and then um, in 2018, um, a court 
issued an award announcing that the, the provision is for. Okay. So I identified uh, the corporations that have similar defensive tactics um, in 2017 and 2018 and put them into two uh, portfolios of stocks. Okay, portfolio A uh, or portfolio one contain the, the stocks of the companies that have these tactics in 2017. Portfolio B or portfolio two have uh, uh, the stocks in it uh, of the companies that have the defensive tactics that were in place in 2018. Okay, and then I kind of look at how uh, the regulatory actions affected these two portfolios of stocks. And here are the results. Okay, you have um, portfolio one of stocks um, in which um, you have the cumulative normal return of these stocks dropped significantly on the event date. In the second event study, you can see kind of uh, similar uh, results, although the, it is less significant than the first one, probably because the market already had some expectation of what's coming. Um, and that is an evidence showing that on the event date, there is a negative return to these portfolios, suggesting that the regulatory action and the court decision kind of have a negative impact on the return of these stocks. Okay, so they, um, so the, the decision to announce these defensive tactics void um, reduces the firm value. Okay, that is the basic finding of this. If you look at um, the, the return of portfolio over time, you see a similar result. Okay. Uh, the vertical line here shows the, the event date and the horizontal line shows the, the level of return on that date. And you see that is a statistically significant negative impact on the portfolio one stocks. Uh, if you have questions about this, we can talk more about uh, during the Q&A. Given the, the time limit, I, I think I'll proceed a little bit fast here. So I also run um, um, some regressions on which um, companies were more strongly affected on the event dates. Basically, you have um, um, uh, the, the ownership structure of the company. So here I look at three uh, variables, the controller, meaning the proportion of shares held by the controller. Uh, and then I introduced the Herbin in indexes, which measure the concentration of the, the ownership of the company. And you will see that uh, these are all positively related to the impacts uh, of, um, sorry, related to the CAR on the event dates, meaning that um, the more concentrated the company's ownership structure is, uh, the less significant the impact of the event on the company's stock become. Okay. So um, I use different models. Okay, I look at the two events, I use different event windows and different models, bivariate model and multivariate model. We can talk more about that if you're interested. But basically the finding is the more dispersed the ownership structure is, uh, the more significant um, the, the event had an impact on the corporate stocks. Okay. This graph shows a similar picture. Okay. So the X axis shows uh, the holder, shareholding of the largest shareholder. Um, if the largest shareholder hold a relatively small proportion of the shares, like 20%, on the event date, you'll have a more negative return. But if the, share, the shareholding is about 80%, you see the returns are all positive. Okay. So, conclusion. Um, it seems that the regulatory actions that have announced these uh, defensive tactics void led to the reduction in the firm value. So, uh, a certain level of defensive tactics is beneficial to the shareholders in China. Okay. So, um, that contributes to the literature on the, on the debates of the value of defensive tactics and how long should it it. Um, so, uh, so far, no, not many studies have looked into China. So it, it provides uh, some empirical evidence uh, of this uh, debate in a different jurisdiction. 
Defense of tactics is particularly valuable for cooperation with the dispersed ownership structure. Okay. And um, the implication, I guess, is that um, even though the company may opportunistically amend the charter to enhance the rights of the existing board of directors and controlling shareholders, a sweeping ban on all these defensive tactics based on mandatory rules would likely reduce the value of firms. A softer approach may be better. Okay. So those are my thoughts. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Zhang, uh, for your uh, great uh, presentation. Uh, I want to remind everyone that uh, we have the Q and fun uh, Q &A, uh, section in uh, the last uh, thirty minutes, so uh, you can choose to post your questions on the uh, chat or use the Q and function to post your questions to the panelists. Uh, our next uh, uh, speaker is Xiao Chen. Hi, can you hear me? Can, can you hear me? Uh, yes? The, I can hear you, but the voice is low. Maybe you can try wear a uh, earphone. You cannot hear me? Oh yeah, it works. It works? Uh -huh. okay. um, so, uh, um, how can I share the screen with you? Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, there is a share screen button in the middle of the... Oh, oh. okay. Okay. I know. Sorry, I'm not uh, very familiar with this system yet. Uh, so first, uh, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, I graduated last year from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. I got my SJD there and I'm still a student. He, uh, now I'm a PhD candidate in China University of Political Science and Law. And this, uh, this is what I, this paper is what I write, uh, co-authored with Professor Shen Wei, uh, who is a professor in Shanghai Jiao Tong University uh, Law School. And uh, um, he's not coming today, so uh, I will present what we did. Um, okay, so this is a chap. Uh, this is a book chapter about the uh, the the new securities law issued last year, uh, which uh, um, basically is uh, the intention is that to explain uh, in order to increase the liquidity. Uh, China made a policy shift uh, in the new security lo securities law. So, um, can you see the paper's title? Yeah, the the securities law, uh, the aftermath of the financial crisis. Uh, so, um, first, uh, this paper will present you what happened before two thousand thirteen, because uh, there is a policy shift. Uh, before and after 2013. Okay, so the okay. so uh, the purpose of the securities market before 2013 uh, was to collect funds for financially troubled state-owned enterprises uh, in order to have this Um, so the state, in order to ensure that the state-owned enterprises got the funds, uh, the they were the state required uh, the state controlled the uh, the state controlled the the stock supply via quota or verification system in the I, uh, in IPO, which means. Uh, which company can be listed is 
controlled by the state and the stock supplies uh, were limited. Uh, so in order to be listed, you need to have privileges uh, to get the listing qualification and each year only limited number of um, primarily state-owned enterprises can be listed in the stock market. Uh, therefore, because this, uh, there, uh, st the, because the stock su supplies were limited, uh, so the investors were willing to pay the premium for the listing qualification itself, because in order to get this qualification, you need um, a good relationship with both the provincial um, government in order to be recommended and uh, be approved by the central government. Uh, so the investors will pay for the shell. Uh, the shell means listing qualification itself. Uh, so not not for the quality of the stock, which means even though your company um, do not perform well um, because you are listing in the market, uh, then the investors are willing to pay for it. So, which means the stock price cannot reflect the, the real value of the, the company, uh, which means uh, it's this practice invalidates the natural selection via capital market, which means uh, in an efficient capital market, uh, better performed stocks can be listed uh, uh, and have good price. Uh, but in China, uh, this, uh, this is not what happened in China, which means uh, once you can be listed, uh, you, you will be there and uh, your price cannot really reflect your quality. Um, and the state uh, used a substantive review of the IPO application, uh, which means uh, implied state guarantee for the quality of the state, uh, the stock. So the investors may blame the China, blame the CSRC, uh, which is China's SEC, on price fluctuation. Um, so um, uh, publicly, the CSRC admitted that it was. Uh, one purpose of the CSRC was to promote stock market boom and the, the boom market. But actually, uh, as we all know, uh, in an efficient capital market, this this, uh, this should be put in the hands of the market itself and the CSRC or SEC or whatever, the regulators should not interfere with these um, practices. And uh, a wide example is in the 2015 stock disaster uh, the state spent 1.5 billion yuan uh, and the newspaper said that it was the national team saved the market. So in the previous practice, uh, the Chinese government do and will uh, save the market um, because there are concerns for uh, market fluctuation and the social instability uh, followed. So, um, as we mentioned, um, because the, st the previous practices, uh, the state control prevented the capital market from performing its functions, uh, which caused the illiquidity uh, because investors could not be better, perf uh, better protected. Uh, they, they were less willing to pay to invest. Uh, so the Chinese government realized the importance of having a efficient capital market, uh, which is serving their long-term interests to develop the economy. So there was a policy shift since 2013, uh, which means uh, before 2013, the purpose primarily was focused to uh, raising funds uh, for SOEs in the stock market. But after 2013, it, it turns to investor protection. Uh, and these changes, uh, happened in the new securities law or first the IPO system changed from verification system to registration system and there was uh, a new chapter a completely new chapter on information disclosure another completely new chapter on investor protection and also the law enhanced the personal liability and changed it or uh, change it from tasteless to to have some enforceability in the news code. Um, first change is in the IPO registration system. Uh, the CSRC retreated from the regulation, uh, uh, from the control of IPO system. First, uh, the decision-making power, 
uh, shifted from the CSRC to the stock exchanges. And uh, the CSRC's uh, share issue examination approval committee, uh, which should vote on whether to approve the application um, was never required, no longer required anymore. And uh, uh, the profitability requirement was abolished, uh, which means the securities law no longer clearly requires that you have to be profitable um, to be listed. And which means a shift pro from the paternalistic regulation as the state assumed that investors cannot protect themselves as they do not have an idea of risk. Uh, no, now the, the state never assumed that. And it was the intended to ensure the quality of the listed companies. Uh, and the lawmakers realized that the profit requirement, um, both for IPO qualification and you, you should remain profitable, is an illusory protection because the law can never ensure that and it should all leave to the hands of the market. And next uh, is the burden of proof uh, should be put on the uh, sponsors, issuers, control shareholders, and de facto controllers. Um, they should prove they did not commit fraud, otherwise they will be liable. And uh, if you made false statements in the prospectus, the regulator can order them to repurchase shares issued in the market. And also mm, there is a suspension of the listing and the relisting system um, previously, and now it has been abolished. Now is a strict delisting system, which means you will not have a second chance to be relisted. Once you are being delisted, then you're done. It's final. And together is an enhanced information disclosure rule. And now the primary purpose is to have a concise, clear, in plain language, understandable information disclosure, which means investors should not be overwhelmed by true but unnecessary information. And uh, there is a more clear, detailed definition, um, which means the law is becoming more enforceable. Uh, for example, the major events and change from important decisions on asset acquisitions. Now you have a clear time and clear percentage. And these enforceable details, uh, like. Uh, who, like the directors, senior managers, and supervisory board, uh, they should conform issuing docs and periodical re uh, reporting writing. And if you have a dissenting opinions, you should also state it in written opinions and explain the reasons, and the issuer should disclose it. And burden of proof is on the issuer's control shareholder, de facto shareholder, director, supervisors, senior managers, sponsors, and the other directly responsible persons to prove their innocence to escape liability, uh, which means enhance the personal liability, as, as I mentioned before. And now we move to the major changes in the investor protection chapter, it's a, a whole new chapter. Uh, first, it requires a mandatory cash dividend. Uh, if there is surplus, the company should pay cash dividends. Um, this is an area traditionally under the corporate autonomy, which means the lawmakers should not uh, directly re require you to pay cash dividends. But why China stepped into it is because historically, um, because the quota system and you will uh, you will not worry about being listed, and you your your primary purpose is to raising funds, so you rarely issue dividends. Um, so, uh, and so that's why the Chinese investors invest just for price differences, and the lawmakers uh, want to change this. And uh, I I think uh, this is. The specific requirements is because of the specific historical context in China, and so it's kind of necessary uh, interference. And uh, distinguished, the new securities law have distinguished treatment upon ordinary investors and professional investors. Uh, for example, sponsors of securities companies or professional investors. So if there's conflict between them, 
and the burden of proof will be put on these professional investors. Uh, they should prove they did not commit fraud or mislead investors. Otherwise, they should compensate investors for the loss. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to introduce you the paying advance system also. Um, it is formally acknowledged uh, by the new securities law, but the experimental practices uh, began in 2012. Um, the first example is the Wan Fu Sheng Ke. Um, first, uh, it, they, they made the false statements, so the CSRC sanctioned both the sponsor and the issuer. And uh, through a negotiation with the CSRC, uh, in exchange for less compensation, uh, for example, the sponsor has been suspended business for only three months. Um, it was a relatively short period, and uh, in order uh, to make sure, because the longer the suspension is, the the sponsor will lose more. So, in order to prevent further lose, the sponsor um, promised to pay in advance. Um, they, which means the sponsor will pay the investors for their loss directly, and then they will seek for the issuer for recovery. And uh, in practice, the sponsor paid 99% of investors within two months. So it was kind of a successful practice. And so in 2015, uh, in a regulation issued by the CSRC, it required all sponsors to promise to pay in advance in the prospectus. Uh, but the new securities law did not require uh, did not require all sponsors to do that. And the law used the word may do that, uh, but not should. So, um, next, mm. uh, I will introduce you the investor protection institutions in China. The both uh, China has two these kind of institutions, and both were under direct control of CSRC. Uh, the first one, CSIPF, uh, was established in 2005, and the second one, ISC, was established since 2014. Uh, so their responsibility includes first, uh, they should bring derivative actions, and if the plaintiffs are these investor protection institutions, they can file a lawsuit in their name, but on behalf of the corporation, and you do not, they do not need to hold more than uh, six months or more than 1% shareholding to file a derivative claim. Uh, in practice, um, they hold, like in each listed company, one stock, uh, and then they will qualify to bring these derivative actions. And uh, they can bring proxy voting as active institutional shareholders, at least this is what the lawmakers expect them to do. And they also can support investors to file a lawsuit. Uh, in practice, uh, the previous years they did opt-in representative actions in practice. Now, next is the uh, milestone change. It's the first time that the law explicitly allow opt-in representative actions, and they put conditional permission upon opt-out class actions in China. And uh, if these opt-out class actions were filed by investor protection institutions with more than 50 investors granted authority, then they can, help, uh, they can bring an opt-out class action. And so before this, uh, the court has a very conservative attitude upon uh, the class actions, uh, secu uh, securities litigation. Only one case, Da Qing Lian Yi, filed collectively as representative action. All other cases afterwards are filed separately as individual lawsuits. Even though the, you have thousands of plaintiffs, you should, have, you should file individually uh, for thousand individual claims, which is very costly and opt out uh, class actions were not allowed. And uh, you have to um, meet a prerequisite to file a securities claim, which means pre-issued, you have to have pre-issued administrative sections. So in 2001, back to 2001, the courts will refuse to accept securities claims 
but investors continuously um, uh, file these claims in practice. And uh, so that's why the political pressure uh, and the central state attention caused the court to conditionally accept these securities claims uh, in 2002. Uh, but uh, in that year, only four statement claims can be accepted. So in practice, uh, for years, the courts uh, were in action. So the Supreme Court publicly admitted its concerns uh, for why uh, the courts were uh, extremely conservative in securities litigation at first. Uh, class actions may cause market fluctuation and market fluctuation may cause social instability, uh, which means um, the investors have implied the expectation on the state uh, to ensure the quality of the stock and therefore the stock price. And also uh, the state shareholders may have to compensate uh, private investors, um, so which means the state shareholders' interest may be harmed. And three is the local cause may have local protectionism concerns um, because uh, while local SOEs were defendants, um, the cause may have social stability concerns is that first uh, opt-out class actions may cause mass action. And second, um, if the local SOEs uh, were if financially influenced by the lawsuit, it may cause unemployment issues, may bring bankruptcy of these companies, and the the, the very limited um, listing qualification. If they lose this listing qualification, it seems a loss to the local economy and a waste of these um, political privileges um, back to the days that they got this um, their resource to be listed. And so um, previously, the securities litigation in China was time consuming and costly. And so that's why the falling rate, uh, filing rate was low, uh, only 25, 7, mm, only 25% of these were for the claims that already, uh, already have the sanctions issued by the CSRC. Uh, which means you are qualified to file a law case, but only 25% of the investors choose to file it. And so what's happened now? So after is that the new law uh, removed the procedural barriers. Um, uh, there were three types of claims now in China versus fixed number opting representative actions, and then unfixed number of uh, up to representative actions, both uh, were filed by the investors. And third is that if it's filed by the investor protection institutions, uh, then you have opt out class actions. Uh, local courts in Shenzhen, Shanghai, and Nanjing already issued the detailed rules and the uh, code for investors who are registered as plaintiffs to join the claim. And you have 30 days as registration period. And if you go to the website of the court, you will see these announcements uh, to call for investors to file as plaintiffs uh, in the local court's website. So opt out class actions. So if you do not register as plaintiffs and you are influenced the investors, um, you also did not file your claim, then the judgment will automatically apply to you. And uh, the investor protection institution for the opt out class action, there will be representatives of all plaintiffs. And uh, so, final part is the evaluation and the implications. So, administrative sanctions uh, were still required to file a securities claim. And only investor protection institutions can file opt out class actions, means the security list litigation was still under state control. Uh, the state can control the total amount of the qualified for filings of security claim, and the state can decide on which company can be sued as opt out uh, to class act to have vast amount of plaintiffs. 
uh, because these events of production institutions were also controlled by the CSRC. Uh, so, uh, and there will, uh, the prediction is that there will not have many opt out class actions. Uh, for example, the ISC since 2014, the past the six years, they filed only six, uh, only four opt in claims, uh, while there were 24 CSRC sections issued. So, so the filing rate uh, was not high. So it's expectable that they will not have many. Uh, many up to class actions filed these by these institutions, um, uh, which means um, until now the Chinese policymakers uh, still kept to the um, export enforcement by market forces, and the primary function of the security litigation was is to cover what administrative regulators cannot do because they have limited resources and time, you cannot discover all the fraud in the market. That's why we need securities litigation to discover the frauds um, that the regulator cannot discover. So that's why the market power is important, but uh, the new security law decay constraints still exist. So private litigation cannot chase the frauds missed by regulatory sanctions. So the state concern is that unlimited securities class actions may harm the state's interest as controlling shareholders, same as before. And second um, is that the state as a regulator have long-term concerns to develop the securities markets through securities litigation, but the state as a control shareholder, they still uh, are unwilling to pay the price for securities litigation and so, what the current law demonstrates is the party state is not determined yet. Uh, so it's why ex explains China is trying to these to explore these alternatives to protect the investors is kind of another try of reform with Chinese characteristics uh, to have their own way to both uh, to achieve both objectives. So expectations on the new rules is that um, the investor protection institutions will be the intermediaries that could both prevent excessive litigation in advance and protect investors when necessary. And they stop providing, uh, stop the state wants to at least expect through these legal changes uh, to stop providing state credit to back up listed companies. And they expect investors to make their own investment decisions based on enhanced information disclosure. And they're no longer expected to the state to save the market. And the registration system and the listing system, uh, companies should survive through market competition and stock prices should reflect the true value of the company. At least these are the lawmakers' expectations on the new rules. Uh, so the evaluation is that it's a big step forward towards an investor-friendly capital market, and the lawmakers realize the importance of efficient capital market, but not ready to pay the full price of it, for it. Another complete shift from a state-oriented approach to a market-oriented approach. It's a very typical Chinese-style reform, which reflects the long-existing conservative or cost cautionary attitude towards non-state controlled power. So my personal opinion is that market portrays unavoidable can bring um, possible changes as uh, the new law can bring possible changes will be limited. So uh, that's all, thank you. Um, uh, how to, uh, okay. Thank you, Xiaochen. Uh, I saw that uh, um, Professor Harbour Hall has a, a question for James. James, can you answer it? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Um, let me share my screen again. Um, all right. Um, sorry. So, um, the first question is, did the court uh, hold defensive provisions per se invalid? That is right. Um, that is uh, the, the decision we find um, 
in the event. Um, so basically, um, I agree with you that um, Article 102, uh, you could say, is quite general. It doesn't prohibit it any form of defensive tactics, but um, uh, in reality, in China's practice, um, the Shanghai court kind of um, decided uh, that they could be interpreted as military rules. Um, and as a result, uh, any um, holding period requirements um, of the listed company would be considered void. Okay. One question you could raise is whether that um, decision will have an impact in subsequent cases. So in China, there's no precedent. Uh, courts don't follow precedents, um, at least not explicitly, but there are studies that show that they do look at these uh, precedents sometimes to, to help them make more consistent decisions. Okay, so I guess um, it's fair to say that uh, um, these other corporations would also be affected by the outcome of this case. The second question is why uh, would uh, defensive tactics be beneficial in China other than to align the interests of the controller? This is a very good question. Uh, so I didn't explain the mechanism in my presentation due to the limited time. So perhaps I could um, clarify. So um, I tend to use the existing theories uh, to explain that rather than to create my own theories. So um, right now there are two possible hypotheses. One is um, defensive tactics raise the premiums of the shareholders. That's something we'll see in, um, in Vancouver versus Barnum. That is when you have a hostile takeover or hostile acquirers who's buying up the shares that kind of benefits the target shareholders um, because um, more people would like to buy and the price goes up. Okay. So a hypothesis could be that if you announce the defensive tactics to be avoid, then um, the companies cannot impose restrictions on the, um, on the hostile acquirers. And um, so the, the, the holding period requirements can no longer be used. And as a result, um, 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 it would kind of um, reduce the, um, okay, I just lost my mind about what I'm going to say. Basically, um, um, if the defensive tactics are void, then um, these companies cannot set up um, um, sorry, uh, it's in the morning and I'm very uh, sleepy. So uh, I kind of uh, have to gather some time to, to think about the question. Um, no problem, you're doing a great job. I was just really more asking whether there might be in the China context, like an entrenchment argument because of the controlling shareholders, there might be a unique um, concern on the part of the controllers, they, they want, they very much want to maintain that position and, and as well the control that they currently enjoy to make sure that their management team is in place. So I, I don't know that that's valid in the Chinese context, but it occurred to me that maybe an entrenchment argument might be, might be there. I, it's just a question and I really appreciate your answer. Yeah, um, I guess um, you could say that uh, if you allow these um, um, shareholders, uh, controlling shareholders to entrench themselves, definitely um, you have uh, fewer hostile takeovers. Um, but if you remove those defensive tactics as the regulatory action and the court decisions did, then you have more um, kind of um, hostile takeover. And there's the likelihood that um, um, the premiums of the shareholders could go up. Okay. But um, the idea is you, you kind of have a balance here. Okay. On the one hand, you don't want um, 
too many uh, defensive tactics. And as a result, um, um, you allow these uh, management to entrench themselves that harms the shareholders. On the other hand, if you have um, removed all the defensive tactics, then it is subject to um, the market forces that may also harm the company because of um, the stability. And um, it kind of let the company lose the chance to get more premiums from using the defensive tactics. Because if you allow the company to set up some kind of holding period requirements, that means the company could um, increase its um, bargaining power with the hostile acquirer. So when the hostile acquirer buy up the share, they have to wait for a longer period. During this period, some more competitors may join the company uh, battle. So more hostile takeovers would occur. More hostile acquirers may come to buy up the share. So the, the premium is even higher. So when the, when the law says the holding period requirement is void, that takes away the company's ability to raise the premium and that reduce the gain of the target shareholders. I think that is the mechanism that I, that I will have in mind. So you will have um, this graph basically showing that um, you, if the law announced the defensive tactics to be void, the premiums the, the target shareholders can get may be reduced in the potential hostile takeover because the hostile acquirer could just take control of the company without much uh, struggle, struggle. And um, there are less competition in this process. So um, that kind of harm the interests of the target shareholders to some extent. And you see that uh, the company with dispersed shareholdings will be harmed more than the company was with a controlling share. I hope I, I made myself clear, so because it's still early in the morning, and um, maybe I didn't convey the message quite well. But uh, let me know if, if anything is unclear. Thanks. Thank you, James. Um, I'm wondering, is there any other questions uh, to panelists? Oh, okay. Um, uh, is there any um, other things our panelists want to add? Uh, like, uh, uh, can we talk about the possible changes to the uh, upcoming um, Chinese corporate law revision? Um, all the other interesting uh, topics uh, we want to discuss. Oh, yeah, James. Please. Yeah, um, I guess I can I can jump in and ask a question. If, um, no one else has a question. Um, so for Zhao Yi's paper, um, have you considered the liability insurance? Uh, perhaps I missed it, but I didn't see it in front of slides. Uh, so you're okay. looking at the, the duty of care. Uh -huh. But um, uh, do you know like um, does um, China have um, um, similar liability insurance regime like in the United States? Uh, uh, I assume not, but uh, in the United States, it seems to me that like a lot of companies purchase these liability insurance to, to protect the directors from uh, suits um, um, based on duty of care. Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, because uh, um, in recent years, there are not a lot of cases uh, uh, talk about duty of care in Delaware. Um, I guess uh, uh, most of them are settled. Or oh, uh, maybe uh, when the plaintiff want to file a case, they normally choose to use the duty of loyalty as a, um, judges may not want to take the risk because the duty of care is uh, um, um, it's not as, uh, uh, I mean, for duty of loyalty, it's uh, assured 
that uh, mm, the judges can uh, use it uh, to uh, punish the director if they find the uh, self-dealing for social care. Um, there's a lot of debate on whether to um, punish the director, whether to assert the liability on directors. So um, I guess uh, um, plaintiffs will um, not uh, choose to use the digital care as a uh, cause of action. And uh, uh, even if they use a uh, court may uh, choose to uh, choose to uh, invade the digital care, use the duty of loyalty instead if they uh, felt the both together. And I saw the um, recent conference uh, by Chinese scholars uh, talk about uh, uh, the several changes, uh, the upcoming changes to the uh, new corporate law. Um, I guess because of the pandemic, I mean, before the pandemic, it should be come out uh, this year, but maybe because of the pandemic, it will uh, come out next year. The so I look forward to see the changes about the fiduciary duty. And did you say you're looking to the cases on the duty of care in, in China? And how many are there? Uh, it should be around 800. And you, you look through all of them? Um, some of them. The next uh, uh, job will be look uh, most of them in details. Mm -hmm. But I know the fam almost all the famous ones are already read it. Uh -huh. uh, so we have uh, seven minutes left. Uh, is there anything um, audience or panelists want to add? Uh, if not, uh, mm, thanks everyone. Take care. I want to say thank you to Joey for doing a great job moderating. I didn't want to uh, turn on my screen with everyone, but just really enjoyed the presentations. Uh, thank you. It's my first time to be a mediator, so I'm kind of nervous, but I think I'm uh, doing okay. <laughs> Well done and very informative and great to hear about uh, James' project and also Professor Chen uh -huh. as well. So, thanks. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.